I won't go into the, all, all the details, but uh, I was kind of a classically and jazz trained young guitar student when I was eight, nine, and ten years old. When the Beatles happened, that changed everything for most of us. And then when I heard Eric Clapton play, that was it. I mean, I, I heard his first solo and I went, I want to do that. So anyway, Fire Falls recording in Mexico down in the studio in the winter of 75, 76. It was down at Criteria when the Bee Gees were down in the hall here and Stephen Stills was down here and it was just like a lot of people in. And I was out recording the, the, uh, the solo on Mexico and I didn't know it at the time, but when I played the one take solo on that, I go into the control room and there was my hero, Eric Clapton, who'd been watching me play. <laughs> And it was a highlight of my career, kind of. It's the only time I've ever met my hero, Eric. And when I came in, he said, keen playing, man, and he left. And it was like, you know, and I crumbled, and it was like, that was about it. I was on a cloud nine for about a week. So we would like to take you down south where it's really warm, down to Mexico. Let's go! Also a great friend here on Uncommon Engineering. We like to uh, delve into the stories and the lessons and the meaning of some really cool people. I've said this before. Uh, it's hard to find someone as talented as Jock and as humble and as gracious and as kind as Jock. And I, Jock, I was actually thinking about this. I think you've been rocking for about 50 years now, but welcome to the show, Jock Bartley of Firefall. Hello, nice to be here. Nice to see you, Dan. <laughs> it's great to see you. You look great. You still look the same. Yeah, I'm holding up over all these years. It sucks getting old, but, you know, still hanging in there. Still practicing? No, not practicing much, but playing, yeah. Yeah? And writing songs and, and doing what I do. And, of course, uh, we don't have any gigs for the rest of the year, but which is tough. But, uh, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So everywhere I go, I wear a mask. So, hey, everybody out there knows Firefall. I mean, one of the greatest bands in the land, particularly hit their heyday in the 70s, toured with uh, Fleetwood Mac and uh, around the country to a lot of large venues. Uh, Jock, I'd like to take the fans, I'd like to take them all the way back. I think you were born in Kansas, if I'm not right. I'd like to take the fans, take us on the journey to you playing the guitar and how that happened and Maybe how your folks facilitated that or prevented that. I'd be interested in hearing that. Well, it was interesting. My mom was a really accomplished musician, a piano and a accordion player. And she was in uh, the uh, Sweet Adelines, which is a barbershop quartets, and did all the arranging and stuff. And so I grew up sitting next to her on the piano bench while she would play and sing and just loved music from the start. And when I was still in Kansas, I, I took some piano lessons and I never took, you know, just like reading stuff off the, you know, da, 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 it, that didn't hit me. But when we moved to Colorado, when I was uh, nine years old, I, um, I saw in a Sears catalog, a bright red guitar for like $59. You know, and I said, Mom, I want a guitar. And she thought that that probably wasn't the best instrument that a new kid could have. 
and she heard about a really famous jazz guitar player named Johnny Smith, who had moved into Colorado Springs, where we lived in the Colorado Springs area, and, and opened a, a, a teaching clinic and a guitar shop. And, and she went and talked to him and he said, well, I don't usually take kids that are that young, but let's see. And I went in and met him and he, he took me on and I was his youngest student. And my first guitar was a Gibson little three quarter size electric guitar, which I've been playing great guitars my whole life. It was great. So my mom got me into it. So when you were learning, did you learn off of music or did he just kind of start teaching you how to play riffs? No, no. I, it was all reading music. And, you know, by the time I was 11 or 12, I was playing Duke Ellington and Bach and all this stuff. And, um, you know, and then in 1964, the Beatles happened on, on uh, Ed Sullivan. I remember watching them on black and white TV and I went, ah, you know, and from that day forward, I started growing my hair, which my dad hated, you know, but I had already played guitar for, you know, three, four, five years. By the time I, all of my friends said, boy, it would be great to be in a band. And, um, you know, I, you know, I started looking to find, uh, to get into a band and, and just was playing everything I could ingest. And it was interesting. Okay, so the Beatles changed a lot of people's lives, of course, and was like the most amazing thing to see. And But when I first heard Eric Clapton play on record, and I bought the, the Fresh Cream album because the cover looked cool. Didn't know who Eric Clapton was. And when that first song played and his solo for I Feel Free came on, Literally, it was like the heavens opened up, and I would if suddenly that was possible. What? You know, and it was like it really was a life changing experience. And at that moment, I realized that everything I had played to date as a 14 year old kid had been written on paper, and you could tell that he was just playing. You know, and then I got into B.B. King and everything, and I just ate it up. I, it was like, wow. So that's when my lead guitar playing skills really kind of jumped off, off the charts, you know. And it was so amazing growing up then because, you know, in the early, in the mid-60s and, and early 70s, boy, the music that, that was out there for people to listen to, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and then you know, the Young Rascals and, and then Crosby, Stills and Nash. And it was just so amazing. And for me personally, to have been a child of the 60s and just soak up everything I could in the 70s and then get in a band with like Firefall that had some really great songs written by our two singer songwriters, Rick Roberts and Larry Burnett, you know, um, and then to have gold records and platinum records and tour with the band and the Doobie Brothers and Fleetwood Mac. It was just a dream come true. And to be a small part of the 70s music, you know, what an honor. And, you know, I'm getting old now, but boy, to have played a lot of those road gigs with those bands and to, to hear Leonard Skinner live and to hear Fleetwood Mac live, just, just amazing, Dan, amazing. So when you picked that thing up and started cranking on it, I mean, did you have dreams of doing that? Or you just said, man, I'm really into this guitar. Like, I just really want to, I just really want to express myself in this guitar. Both. And the truth is, funny, funny enough, when I was about 13 years old and I'm thinking, I'm going to be a musician. I think that's what I'm going to do. I would, you know, I can remember getting pencil and paper out and practicing my autograph. Like, Hey, how, how would, if somebody asked me for my autograph, how would I sign it? No, I don't like that. Huh? You know, so I kind of knew that the, what I really wanted to do was music. I was a really good basketball player, had a great gut jump shot, played no defense, you know, give me the ball. I want to shoot, you know, was the high score on my high school basketball team for a couple of years. And uh, I'm an artist, still am an artist. Um, and you know, so I had, I grew up thinking, my mom really 
instilled in me that I could pretty much do anything I wanted to do. But I think I knew all along that the best thing I did and the most fun and the most immediate satisfaction came from playing music. And, uh, you know, when it came time, you know, I was an art student at CU in 1968, 69. And, uh, you know, when it came to deciding, well, am I going to be an artist or a musician full time? It was no, it was no question. It was like music was it. So take us down that road a little bit. Uh, I mean, I know you were, uh, you got picked up by Zephyr there a little bit, but talk to us, talk to us a little bit about that progression. How did you kind of get into that first gig where you were actually getting some money? <laughs> Boy, that, that took a while. Um, <laughs> in high school, I was in a band called the Countdowns and we played, you know, Louie Louie and money and all those songs from the the sixties and stuff. And, and, once you got a taste of playing in front of people and getting their reaction to what you were doing, you know, it was just so, so amazing and pretty much addicting. It was like being on stage and doing what you did best and playing for people, you know, it was amazing. And, you know, having been a, a good athlete on certain things, I was a baseball and a basketball player, but same kind of deal, you know, when, when you were hot as a shooter in basketball, you know, and the crowd, you'd hit, you'd hit a long jump shot and the crowd would go nuts. It was like, wow, this is great. But of course I was only five foot 10 and that kind of hindered me when I went to see you. It was like, oh, everybody else was like really big. And I thought, well, my basketball career is over. <laughs> funnel, you, funnel you into, uh, so how, how did it get to be that you kind of end up starting your career with Zephyr there? How did that happen? I was in a lot of bands in Boulder. And Boulder was amazing then because um, in the early 70s, Caribou Ranch and Caribou Records came up to Nederland. And, you know, and everybody from Michael Jackson to Elton John and John Lennon were up there recording. And Boulder, you know, was a, a short drive away from Red Rocks, which was one of the best live venues in the in the world to play and you know in in the bands that I was in leading up to joining Zephyr Tommy Bolin a famous guitar player left Zephyr to join a local band called Energy and then joined the James Gang and later Deep Purple um, Candy and David Gibbons looked around and saw as I, I was an available lead guitar player and hired me for about a year and we made one record and and uh, didn't do too much and that kind of disbanded. And I was just on, you know, and then I joined, I fell, totally fell into uh, touring with Graham Parsons and Amy Lou Harris in the Fallen Angels, which was a country band. And I was so not country, I was a rock guy, but I was a good player. So I kind of, I, I fell into that. The guy that they had hired sight unseen and their first gig was in Boulder of all places. They came out from LA. He got drunk that night and was not that great of a player anyway. And, and the manager and the road manager said, we have to find somebody. And I happened to go to the show and said, I'd love to try out. And I went and auditioned with them. And though I wasn't a country picker, I was a better guitar player than the guy they had. So they hired me. And that was my, my, um, my first big break into the big time kind of, because on our second gig, we played our first gig, Grand Parsons in Austin, Texas. And then the second gig we played was in Houston, Texas at Liberty Hall. And in walks uh, Neil Young and Linda Rodstad to sit in with us, you know? And I'm on stage going, and I remember thinking distinctly, man, four days ago, I was painting apartments to pay for my rent. Didn't have a gig, didn't have any money. You know, and I'm painting apartments to make to pay my rent. And now four days later, I'm on stage with Neil Young and Linda Ronstadt. And amazingly enough, that was the first time that Amy Lou Harris and Linda Ronstadt ever met or ever sang together, which was incredible. And after our show, Neil and Linda invited all the bands to come over to their hotel room. And we stayed up till dawn. And I re distinctly remember when Graham Parsons would pick up a guitar and play 30 country songs by 
all these country artists who I'd never heard of, but Linda and Emmy Lou had their 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 uh, faces together, blending their voices for the first time, and it was unbelievable to see and be a, a small part of. But you know what great what great uh, vocals they had, and Emmy Lou is still going strong today. Sometimes they uh, always a little luck is is good, but think about if you you didn't go to that initial concert and you weren't around and you weren't available, then you wouldn't right. have put yourself in a chance to, to get in there. Well, it's funny because I've talked to a lot of musicians and people and you know this in sports and you've been around football for your whole life. You know, a lot of times it's that one lucky break. And if the window of opportunity opens for you, if you're not ready with what you do, that'll close for you and you, you may, not, might, may not ever get one again in your whole life. And I had a couple of windows of opportunity that I was fortunately ready for and was playing good. And when I got the, got the gig, suddenly things just opened up. You know, I mean, look, you look at in football, for instance, you know, Tom Brady, when du Drew Brees got hurt, you know, Brady stepped in and bam, there's, you know, you know, however many Super Bowls later. Yeah. Yeah. The similar kind of thing happened really with Firefall, right? I mean, weren't you guys kind of trying to get something going a little bit? I, I can't remember the exact story, but. Uh, oh, the Chris Hillman story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Boulder, you know, Stephen Stills moved to Boulder, Chris Hillman from the Birds, Richie Fury from Buffalo Springfield and Poco, uh, Joe Walsh, Dan Fogelberg, all these people, all these famous rock stars from, from Southern California, most of them got tired of life in, in LA and moved to the mountains above Boulder, Colorado. So at any given moment, you'd see Stephen Stills walking around Boulder and go, wow, there's Stephen Stills. Um, I met, when I was playing with Graham Parsons, the fellow who replaced him in the Flying Greeter Brothers was Rick Roberts. And he and Chris became partners and then Rick left the Burrito Brothers and had a couple of so solo records. But uh, I met Rick Roberts when I played with Graham and Amy Lou in, in New York City. And we said, you live in Boulder? Hey, I live in Boulder too, we should get together. And he didn't think I was a very good guitar player because I was playing country music and not very well really. Uh, but uh, we got together and he saw me play at Tulagi's in Boulder with the Tim Goodman band and I was just burning in my rock and roll element. And he called me and said, you know, I'm, I th I'm thinking about making another solo record on a and Records. You wanna be my guitar player? And I said, sure. And suddenly then we found Mark Andes from the band Spirit and Jojo Gunn who had moved to Boulder too. And Mark and Rick and I started playing and it became pretty obvious that it may not be a Rick Roberts solo album, it might be a band we were forming. And Rick, Rick said that he knew of a singer-songwriter in Washington, D.C., Larry Burnett, the fellow who wrote Cinderella. Um, and he said, he's doing nothing. And he and I, I've, I've talked about flying out to Boulder to get in a band, let's get him out here. So Rick flew Larry out and the four of us started practicing and we had a local drummer before Michael Clark from the Birds joined into Firefall. And Dan, the most amazing thing for me was we had about 25 or 30 original songs of Rick Roberts and Larry's for Mark and I to play on. So from our first day of practice, we had plenty of material. And we had songs like Mexico and Larry had Cinderella and Rick had Livin' Ain't Livin' and all these great songs. And, and Mark and I were the two players in the band. I was the hot lead guitar player and Mark was the incredible bass player. And we had 25 songs to work out from our first day of practice, which is unbelievable. You, you never hear of that. And um, we just thought, you know, and it was funny because in early days of Firefall, once Michael Clark came in as the drummer, who'd been in the Birds and the Flying Breeder Brothers too, back in LA, um, we had our sights set for let's get a record deal, let's be rock stars, let's put out records and, and do this because we have all the songs. And in my experience, it really, really boils down to that a band needs the singers and the songs. 
there are hundreds of thousands of great guitar players. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of great bass players. But the songs, you, you need to have the songs first and foremost. And Mark and I joined into a band that had all the songs just ready to go. Now, the problem there, of course, was that we had what ended up being five and then later six diametrically opposed personalities, you know, and a couple of guys had drug problems and one guy was an alcoholic and, and, you know, and we never were the best of friends, but boy, when we tried to make records, it was, it was a happening thing. And it was interesting because Firefall couldn't really get anything going. We were sitting around Boulder and we'd play at the Good Earth and we'd go play in Aspen, but there wasn't really anything happening. We were shopping our demo tape that Chris Hillman, who was, was the, the uh, bass player from the Birds, um, uh, had produced a three song tape for us. And we had a manager and he was shopping our tapes and nobody wanted it. And Chris was out on the road playing as the Chris Hillman band. And Rick Roberts and I would go out on the road as his backup band. And later we got Mark Andes too. So we had three guys of Firefall playing in the Chris Hillman band. And I think what you were mentioning before was we were out on the road and Chris found out that he was sick. And we had a three day stand at the other end in New York City. And Chris played the first one. And that day before our gig at the other end in New York, he went and saw a doctor and the doctor said, you gotta go home. You've got, uh, God, what was it? Uh, hepatitis. Mm. You've, got, you've got hepatitis, Mr. Hillman, you need to, you need to go home tomorrow and, and recover and the, you can't do anything about it and everything. So Chris was going to have to cancel the last two days. And Rick and our manager said, Hey, we'll just fly Larry and, and Michael Clark out and we'll finish the two day stand as Firefall, which of course nobody had ever heard of before, but we had guys from the birds and the flying breeder brothers and spirit. I had been in Graham Parsons and Amy Lou Harris and stuff. So the other end said, okay, and Atlantic Records, who our manager was talking to at that point, came down and saw us and wanted to sign us immediately. And we got a record deal and wow, there it was. This unknown band from Boulder, you know, gets a record deal and goes to Miami to, uh, to make a record. But you're ready when your number called. I want to back up and focus on a couple things that you touched on, which I always impress. Talk again about the dynamic of the team, and you're saying, well, you didn't really get along that well, but the music was great. How did you negotiate that? Who negotiated that? Was that you and Rick? Was that just talk about how you deal with the team dynamic? Because we've all seen all these bands that the egos get in the way and they end up falling out and separating. And right. can you just expand on that teamwork portion of it in the band? Well, one of the things that I have always known pretty much from the time even before I was in bands, that when I played on a song, I needed to put what the song needed first and foremost. And it didn't need me to show off and play all my fancy licks and you know do stuff. If a, if a slow song was happening and it need me to just play the perfect thing between a vocal passage, that's what I was in the band to do. And Mark Andy's on bass, had the same kind of concept. I'm giving myself up as a musician to the song, you know, and one song might need me to play fast and burn and another song may, might need me to do next to nothing, you know, and it was the song that was first and foremost. And, you know, and the, the vocalist singing the lyrics on that song, everything I did as a guitar player had to embellish that and help that out. And having been a basketball player, and I mean, you know this for as long as you've been a coach. How many years, when was your first coaching job? Uh, 19, well, yeah, 1983, 1983. Yeah. So you've been doing it for decades and decades and decades and trying to get that chemistry and trying to have you know, maybe you have a wide receiver who wants the ball all the time and he wants to show all of his moves on every play and everything. And, you know, you, uh, most of the time you don't have successful teams or win games like that. You have to be a unit. 
you know, that's the one of one of the things that I really thought that Cody, your son, as the CU quarterback, was so good at was he was he complimented what you put out there and each guy's strengths, you know, and uh, you know that's what that's what you have to do when you're in a group trying to be successful, and in football or basketball, you know, that's winning games, and in and in a, a band, that's playing songs to the maximum effect and you know make that song as good as you can whether it's on stage or in the studio and um we were all pros and when it came time to make a record we knew we would just listen and as, as a musician i would listen and go well i better lay out here and not do much and here's where i'll shine a little bit or here's what you know and when you put as a musician when you put the song and the greater good of the band first, that's when you have a lot of your success, you know, to me. Um, and, uh, you know, Firefall was a really good example of that. And we had our problems out on the road sometimes because when you're, you know, when you're in a rock and roll band, you got one alcoholic doing his thing and one drug addict, drug addict doing his thing and you're trying to play good every night that can be a problem, you know, because particularly rock and roll in the seventies was, you know, it was, it was pretty out of control, but um, you know, if you be true to what you're there trying to do, which is play good and, and make every song as good as you can make it, you know, we, we were really lucky. And I know how fortunate I am to have found two really good songwriters to play on their songs. Now, as it turned out, our two really good songwriters were two of the guys that were over the top a lot. And, you know, oftentimes, I mean, maybe not oftentimes, but sometimes live couldn't sing or couldn't do their gig. And, you know, me and Mark would be looking at each other like, what are we going to do? Our lead vocalist can't sing tonight, you know. But in the studio, it was, it was really great. And when you make a record, you know, you can, you know, a lot of bands like Little Feet or, you know, you know, some bands, man, they want it on the first take or the second take or it's not happening. Other bands take months to perfect an album and get all the guitar parts just right. And it's a balance between just letting go and knowing what you want to do, but not thinking too much. And, you know, for anybody who was listening to this, Dan, one of the things that I wanted to give a piece of advice to is, you know, and it's really... And it, and it transcends music. It's, it's whether you're a writer or a poet or maybe an actor or a, 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 a musician, you know, don't overthink stuff. You know, you know, when you used to watch Michael Jordan run a fast break and there'd be two or three defenders between him and the basket and there'd be Scotty Pippen out on the corners and Michael wasn't really thinking. He was just reacting and he didn't know till the last moment whether he was going to go this and shoot or pass it behind his back to Scotty or he didn't know he was just reacting to the ever present now. And, you know, and you see that all the time in great sports people, you know, uh, an in catches the ball and he's got five defenders in front of him and he still scores, you know, it's just because his talent is great. He's got all the good moves, but he's not thinking too much. He's just being a natural athlete, you know? And uh, that's kind of how I view myself as a lead guitar player is, you know, I just react to the moment. And a lot of the times, um, I really don't know what I'm going to play next. And I don't even really know or care what I just played because you get in the moment and you're just soloing and then it's over and you go, wow, that was fun. Do you think it's the variety of your experiences? You were talking about playing some country and that wasn't really your deal, but you did it. Do you think it's both the experience and the variety of mediums yeah. that you've played in that allow you to do that, plus the intuitive? How, do you, how would you quantify that? Well, that's a really good question. And, you know, I really think that it, it, a lot of times it boils down to, and I'll just talk about music here, but it really does apply to sports or writing a novel or being a, a poet or being a painter, you know, is that um, as, a, as a guitar player, 
you can't really be transcendent as a soloist unless you put 10, 20 years worth of practice and getting all of the chops and getting, okay, I can do this. Oh, I can play that scale. I can play fast. I can play slow. So you really have to have in your arsenal of things that you might play at any given moment, um, you have a lot of things there that you've practiced and really worked on for a long time. I mean, back before I had a gig, I was playing, you know, I was playing like six or eight hours a day. And then I'd pack up my guitar and I'd go play some four hour club game. You know, I, I lived and breathed music. So I, I have to say that, and, and you can tell with, you know, like, listen to Jimi Hendrix at times or Eric Clapton or Carlos Santana or any of the really great soloists on guitar, you know, that you kind of can get to a place where you transcend all that you've learned and all that you know and all the thinking that you've put in and practice you've put in and you can transcend that and just play what's needed and just play the perfect thing. And I'm not a real religious guy, an organized religious guy, but I'm a moral guy and stuff. But the closest I've ever been to God is when I'm playing. And, you know, it's just like I have literally looked down at my hands before and just kind of watched them play great and thinking, wow, this is great. You know, and it's really not a, a thinking thing. It's more of a right brain thing. And, um, you know, certainly not every solo or even many solos that are play are divinely inspired or, you know, coming from the muse. But there are times when, you know, you know, I'll play a solo and just, you know, and people afterwards will say, God, that was great. Or, man, you must have really figured that out or whatever. And there was really not a lot of thought involved with it. You just were in the moment playing. And, and I would just say that, you know, whatever you are as a creative person, you know, to just go with it, trust your instincts, try to let the muse come through you and quit thinking so damn much. Yeah. I've, I've always been fascinated by the songwriting process and how that comes about and, and how a person, I know you do have a solo album and you've, you've written some songs as well. And can you walk us through that process a little bit? I mean, it's just so mystifying to me of just, you're walking down the sidewalk and something comes to you and you put some things together. That's just the most fascinating right. thing to me. I developed really late as a songwriter and, you know, it was a good thing that I was in a band that had two really good songwriters who had finished products and all I had to do was play on them. But as a songwriter, it's interesting because, you know, oh, five, 10 years ago, I used to go to Nashville a lot and give these songwriting and creativity classes. And there would be like 30 country songwriters out in the crowd just wanting to, you know, ready to hear what I was about to say. And, you know, I would say, quit thinking so much and just let the muse come through. You know, I would hear stories about, you know, two or three songwriters working on a set of lyrics for six months and nobody had ever sung anything yet. I went, what? You know, songs are singing and singing are, is words. And not every word or phrase has to be the most meaningful thing in the world and a lot of times there's the kind of the John Lennon school of writing which kind of says it doesn't really matter what the words mean it matters only what they sound like when they're being sung you know you listen to you know uh uh come together you know and you listen to those lyrics and said what what the heck is he, is he talking about and it's just you know being poetic and stuff but to answer your question one of the things that I have found, now each song is different. Some songs come with a title will pop into your head or a first verse, the lines of a verse will pop in. Um, for a lot of musicians, what happens is you'll be playing something on the guitar and go, wow, that's cool. And oh, I really like this. And then on top of that, those chords that you're playing, you start mouthing words or singing, da 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 
but da, 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 and you're going, oh, that's kind of cool. And you're, and you're letting this process happen. And then all of a sudden, if you're right-brained enough, and it re really takes some practice, you know, because you have to be pretty fearless. You have to be childlike in your, uh, your creativity because you can't be judgmental. You know, because if you're judgmental of every line that comes out of your mouth that you might want to put into a song, you're never going to finish a verse, you know. But if you're, if you're flowing enough, you can just be singing melodies and then all of a sudden, sometimes, a phrase or four lines of a verse will just sing themselves. And you'll go, wow. And you got to write it down and you're going, oh, what was that? Or, you know, and... And, you know, if you open yourself up to that, a lot of the times you'll be singing something and the, a, a, a line of a verse or the first line of a chorus will just pop in and you go, well, there's my title right there. That's perfect. You know, and it's really just being receptive enough to the creative muse, wherever that comes from. You know, it's that Carl Jungian kind of thing of the collective subconscious where, you know, you know what you know, but there's this whole other thing, you know, and if you, if you let lines just come in, a lot of times you can write an entire verse without even thinking. Or in, you know, I've written a few songs that pretty much came out real fast and 10 minutes later, I had a complete lyrical song and had I been thinking about it you know I wouldn't have been there and, you know and you might go back then and get left brain and nitpicky and go well let's see I don't like that rhyme very much but you know when you listen to songs by Stevie Wonder who just had a birthday yesterday or Paul McCartney or speaking of birthdays I think we're uh, pretty close here are we not uh, mine's tomorrow. When's Happy yours? Happy birthday. There you go. There we go. When's yours? I'm in November. Oh, oh November. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 have, I have a big one tomorrow, so it's like not too happy about it. But hey, age is, you know, you're only as young as you think and, and, you, and you act like. And, you know, I've been a musician all my life, and I don't think I ever grew up. Part of me is still, you know, six years old, and part of me is still 14 years old playing in my first band and stuff. But to, to finish up, yeah, go back. I was just going to say, just to finish up as a songwriter, yes, you can agonize over the, just every line being right and take three months to write a song, you know. But if you're right-brained enough and trusting enough in your muse, you can have songs pop out. The song that I wrote for suicide prevention that led me into becoming a spokesman for suicide prevention for a number of years in a national way, um, that song came out so fast that I was surprised. It was like, wow, where is this coming from? Because I didn't really have any, I didn't have any experience with suicide or the heartbreak of a parent losing a child or something, but unbelievably, it, that song, if you look at the lyrics of my song, Call On Me, um, it's a really positive song about gaining strength in adversity and that other people are with you and other people have been there before and you're not alone. It came out real quick and it's, it's a really positive message so song. And had I tried to write a positive, positive message song on suicide prevention, I'm sure I would have failed about it. It was because I, I just trusted in whatever that muse is and let it come out. So it took me 20 or 30 years to be kind of a right brain lyricist. As a, as a guitar player, I've been on automatic pilot for decades, just playing whatever felt like. And not everything like that was, was good or anything, but a lot of times, it was the perfect thing at the right time. But as a lyricist dealing with words, that was really tough. And it, it took me many years to just kind of let go and say, quit thinking so much, quit thinking so much. Yeah, it seems like, Jock, that you, uh, so many athletes have a fear of failure. It either seems like you've overcome that or you don't have that or you work through that. And I'm wondering, did you ever have any times in your life where you really did fail and it was resonated with you or you just, 
work through it because somehow you've managed to get to the Michael Jordan of guitar players and get along this road. Well, Just thanks, for, your thanks for saying that. I, I don't know that I would agree, but thanks for saying that. It, and I am a really good lead guitar player, but um, it, there have been times, well, for instance, I've written a lot of really bad songs to get to the point to where you can write good ones. You know, just like I remember when, you know, as a, as a fourth grader practicing free throws, you know, I was terrible, you know, and the more you get that muscle memory going, it's like, okay, here we go, here we go, you know, and, you know, the only two things that I've really ever really worked hard in my life were guitar playing and my jump shot. <laughs> but I was only five foot ten, so that only went that only took me so far. But um, yeah, you know, you have to fail. And the thing is, is that if you're writing in a room by yourself and you let some of these words just tumble out of your mouth and you think they're terrible, you won't ever play it for anybody. You know, it's not like being, you know, on national TV and having the interception on the last play of the game that loses the game or something. But, you know, as a quarterback, you got to go for it. And, you know, I, you've, you've coached a lot of amazing players and you have to have a kind of a short memory. You messed up on the last play. I'm going to go get him this play. So you've also, uh, you talked about the right brain. Uh, I think, I think my guy, Mark combo has got, you, you also are into art. I don't think we're able to, pull up any of your Beatles art, but I know uh, you did some artwork on your solo album, which by the way, the owner of the manus manuscript to Blindside, that would be me. I do have that, you know. Oh, Just, right. I remember. That's, that's yeah, really I cool. do. I still have it. I still have it. So maybe Mark could throw up uh, your, uh, your artwork and let's talk about that other side of your, your artistry and how that came about. I thought about being able to uh, bring a couple of pieces of art down and being able to show people but it's interesting because with art um it's a longer process you know and you're you're painting or drawing and then you go how about this and if you're not careful you can overwork a painting and go god i wish i could go back five minutes but it's already gone music is so immediate you know that you play something and it's gone unless you're in the recording studio and you're making a record or something. But um, I've been blessed. You know, my, my dad was a really good artist, a, a commercial artist who was really stylistically from the 40s. He was trained at the Chicago Art Institute. And, um, you know, and he ended up having a family and then becoming a banker and then a real estate guy and all this stuff and never got to really do his passion of art, you know. And he told me, you know, a couple of times uh, long before he passed, you know, that I was so lucky to be able to actually make a living at what I love doing and that I'm good at, you know, and, uh, you know, he's right. And like I said, when I was in high school and college, I didn't know what I wanted to be because I thought I could be just about anything. I might have been an actor. I might have been a playwright. I might have been a novelist. I was already a painter and, a, and drawing. And, but you know, music was just so, there's nothing like being on stage with your amp and your guitar sounding just fantastic and being there and going, ooh, it's like, oh, time stands still almost. Hey, before we go too much further, I did want to tell you um, the quick story, which you mentioned about one of your favorite songs was Mexico. Yeah. Um, so I've told Rick Roberts, who wrote the song Mexico and sang it, that I was really born to play on his song. That song was perfect for me. And when Firefall, before we got our record deal, um, I was playing Mexico every night and had an idea what I wanted to do, but I wasn't thinking and just blowing and just burning. So when it came time to record Mexico, in the studio on our first album, I knew that that was going to be my time to shine, you know, and I was, it was at Criteria Studios in Miami. The Bee Gees were down the hall. Steven Stills was down the hall. We were the new band Firefall no, nobody would ever heard of. And um, I remember being out in the studio, warming up, and my amp 
which I still have and I use when I play in Colorado, um, was sounding great. My old Cherry Sunburst Les Paul was sounding great. I was warming up, you know, and people were in and out of the control room. And uh, the producer, Jim Mason, pushed the button, said, you ready to go? And I went, yeah, sounding good, let's go. Now, as, a pro, as, a, as an insert here, the day before I did my solo on Mexico, the mariachi horn section had come in in the middle of the song, in the middle of my solo and played, da 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 So I knew in the back of my brain, I was gonna have to deal with something that I'd never played with before, but I thought, no problem, let's go. So we, I start recording and I'm playing, it's going good. First verse, I'm playing. Cause I knew the song, I was ready. I didn't have to practice it. I was warm, my fingers were working good. My amp was sounding good. And when it got to the solo on that take, you know, I'm playing along, playing along saying, where are the horns? My, my brain's thinking, where's that horn section? So I'm playing and then suddenly there they are. And I stopped and then I played and then they played and then I played and then they played. And then I finished and it ended up being a one take solo. And at the end of the song, the, uh, the producer said, that was great, come on in. And I went, I had no idea what I was gonna do with the horns there. Keep what I did on tape, which is what's cool about the studio. You can keep what you just played and try to beat it, you know? And um, I said, let me, let me see if I can beat that and play something better when the horns play. And he said, no, that was fantastic, come on in. And I went, Jim, I've been working for Mexico for like four years. Let me just have another shot at the solo. Keep what I did. He said, no. And I went, no. So I take my guitar off and I kind of storm in the studio to give him a piece of my mind. I want to try this solo again. I walk in the control room and the first person I see is my hero, Eric Clapton, who's been watching me play. And of course, then I just kind of crumbled and blah, turned into Jackie Gleason, you know, humming, 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 you know. and, 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 and Eric, stood up and said, keen playing, man. He shook my hand and left. And I kind of sat down and went, you know, oh my God. And, and Jim Mason said, now what do you want to do again? I went, nothing. I couldn't, you know, had I known that Eric Clapton was watching me play when I played that, I would have, I would have been terrible. But as it turned out, you know, and looking back at my career, that's one of the two or three highest moments of, of my musical career to have been playing really good when unbeknownst to me, my hero, Eric Clapton was watching me play. Did you ever brush up against him ever again? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Wow. But, uh, you know, and he recorded two or three of his albums in Criteria 2, 461 Ocean Boulevard and a few of those and everything. But it, it was amazing, you know, to, uh, you know, and it just goes back to me that I know how fortunate and lucky I've been to be at the right place at the right time to, you know, get to meet some of my heroes or play on stage with Michael McDonald or Stevie Winwood or, you know, or some of the greats where, you know, I was just the guitar player in Firefall. So I've had a pretty charmed career and, you know, it hasn't been all perfect and it, you know, there's been, you know, down years where I'm barely making a living and stuff, but man, I can't complain a bit. And I just know how lucky I am to 40 some years later, still doing it. Well, I, I want you to take off your humble jacket. Now you've been doing this for a long time, as you mentioned, and very successfully. And so again, what you obviously made some decisions along the way, personally, at that that allowed you to keep going and allowed you to develop. And yeah, there's a certain amount of luck in there, but sometimes luck is where preparation meets opportunity. Absolutely. If, if you're writing the success story for some young rocker musician out there, maybe you're going to give some advice to your younger self. There has to be some, some key thoughts that you're kind of going, well, this, these decisions or these thoughts or these processes allowed me to kind of get here. What would some of that be? Well, that's really, that's really good because there are so many young musicians trying to figure out how do I get from here to here? And really one of the most important things is be true to yourself and be honest with yourself so that if you're not really very good yet, you know, because almost everybody, including myself at times back in the past, 
really thought I was doing great, where I really needed to, to work more and spend more time getting better. But um, don't try to please anybody else, you know? Follow your dream. And if you want to be a heavy metal guitar player, or if you want to be a country player, or if you want to be a writer of novels, do it and trust your own self and really follow your dream and not your father's dream or not, you know, your teacher's dream or whatever. And you got to put the work in because being really great at something really hardly ever happens without decades worth of work. Now, maybe, you know, Carl Lewis or somebody who was just fast his whole life, you know, he just, he just had to, you know, train to, you know, to, to run the 200 or whatever, the 100 meter dash or something. Maybe that's, you know, just God-given talent. But for, for somebody, you know, throwing a football or playing a guitar or, you know, typing out, you know, a novel or poetry or something, you just got to do it. And it's the muscle memory that, you know, you, you have to put the time in. But you're right. You make your own breaks. And, and like I said earlier, if, if you're lucky enough to get a window of opportunity into the big time, whatever you're shooting for the big time, um, if you're not ready, it's going to close. You know, if you think you're a, a great quarterback and you get your chance and you're not ready, it's not going to happen, you know, or else you'll be put back on the bench when the, when the starting quarterback gets healthy or something. Um, so it's, it's really important to be true to yourself and follow your dream and take the steps necessary to get as good as you can so that when and if a window of opportunity does come to jump into that you're ready. I mean, that probably even goes for, you know, business. If you want to be a top-notch business accountant and get a job with, you know, some Fortune 500 com company, if you're, not, if you're not ready, you know, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. So you obviously got a lot of that from your parents. Now, you're a parent as well. And it's interesting because you talk about that creativity part. You have one, one of your son is, is uh, Jamie, right? Is it Jamie? He's, yeah. he's a drummer. He's a drummer. And your daughter is a physicist. I will insert this one story. When I was in Colorado Springs once, I heard a guy talk that his dad had worked with Einstein and, and all the Nobel laureates got together, including Einstein. And there were three things they had in common. One was they all got in trouble uh, for playing with fire when they were a kid. They did not like math, although it was a solution, but they all played a musical instrument. Wow. So I want, I want to know how this outstanding person and rock star musician, this Hall of Fame, Colorado Music Hall of Fame, by the way, Jock Bartley, should be in the National Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Maybe soon. We'll work on that. <laughs> so you have a drummer and you have a physicist. So talk to us about the parenting of those two people. Well, Jamie, my son, not only is a really great drummer, I bought him his first set of drums when he was like three years old. Um, he's a, a really amazing artist and graphic designer. And he, he's having trouble with his life of paying child support and, you know, paying for his apartment and all that kind of stuff. But he's an amazingly creative guy. My daughter used to play clarinet and played piano. So she was a musician for a while, but I, she kind of always knew she was going to be a scientist. And you know, it's interesting. One time when in Boulder and my house was right next to the mountains, we would go out to our Jeep and I'd put the, the, uh, the, the back down and we'd get pillows and we would watch the bats come out from the mountain and catch insects in the summertime and watch the moon and just tickle each other and, and laugh and, and bond. And she was like about seven years old. And one time we did that, the crescent moon was about, was a little bit above the mountain. And I said, Jess, if, if you're really slow and you watch, the moon's going to go behind the mountain in about five minutes. And we sat there and we're watching and sure enough, the moon went below the mountains. And she said, how did that happen? 
And I said, well, you know, and I'm no scientist, but I said, okay, so here's the moon, here's the earth, we're turning. So we turned. So really it was, you know, and I kind of in a rudimentary kind of way told her about how the earth was spinning and the moon didn't really go behind the mountains, but you know, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. I found out about 20 years later from her that that was the moment where she went, oh my God. And for the longest time, she wanted to be an astrophysicist, you know, but to have, and when she was growing up, I was throwing, uh, you know, and we had a bunch of uh, National Geographics and I would throw um, botany at her or, or uh, God, why can't I think of the, the name of uh, studying old bones and archaeology or, you know, anthropology. I was throwing all kinds of stuff at her just to see if anything would click. And it was that time where she f could visualize that, you know, and when she became this amazing scientist who was traveling all over the world doing these brain scans on teaching um, college students hooked up to an MRI machine. Um, she would teach them uh, really deep Einsteinian type of math or physics prog uh, problems and plot what type, what parts of the brain were being used to try to figure that out. And a lot of groundbreaking stuff. And, you know, and it, it was amazing, you know, when she graduated from college, I felt so just so happy for her and thought one little spark like that, you know, you never know can set somebody off, which is another way of saying how important good parenting is, you know, and how many parents are having a bad day or, you know, or just, you know, get out of here or, you know, go outside and play and, 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 and not, and not really take the time when your kid is, you know, wanting to ask you something or, find out something and everything. So, you know, you're a great parent. You got great kids. You know, I got, I got a couple of great kids and a couple of great grandkids and, and you can just do the best you can do. But part of that creative thing, you know, comes, comes from that is just like, you know, fo following it, following the, the, the muse there. Yeah, so much depth to you. I, I, I do the fans a disservice. Uh, we focus, we use, you're so awesome. This is one of the many things I love about you. you you're so much more than just firefall and music. But uh, we got a couple of clips here. I want to take the fans back here. I think uh, my guy Mark Honbo has got a couple of clips queued up here. And this will probably jog your memory. Let's, uh, let's go back to Dick Clark right here, Mark Honbo, and, and see <laughs> our good jock on, uh, on American Bandstand here. Woo! We're going hopping, hopping, we're going hopping today, when things are popping, the Philadelphia way, we're going to drop it, drop on all the music they play on the bandstand, bandstand. Somebody shoot the drummer, shoot the drummer. Or no, you shoot the piano player. This is Rick, Rick Roberts, the lady standing next to you. Well, she is a, a recent, uh, actually part-time addition. She came in to help us with this song. This is Lisa Nimzo. Hello, Lisa. It's very nice to see you. How do you do? I, I, I made a mistake. My grandmother said, never extend your hand to the lady. Wait till she extends it to you. That's in America only. In Europe, it's proper for the man to... That's a little known fact, but true. Where did he get this trivia? Sorry. Have you traveled extensively? Well, not nearly as extensively as I wanted to, and not at the right times, either. I can't tell you how glad I am to know that, because I've been apologizing for that move all these years. Hold on, Lisa, let me meet everybody else. Who's the fellow behind us? This is Jock Bartley on guitar. Hello, Jock. Nice to have you with us. On, uh, don't tell me, they're congas or bongo. What are these things? These are congas and kumbas and things. That's Joe Lala. Hello, Joe. Nice to have you here. Uh, let's go to the bass player right here. Please. The bass player is Mark Andes. Mark, nice to have you with us. Uh, if you'll... I don't know where we're going to find the drummer. Somehow they'll find the drummer. The drummer is Tris Imboden. Nice to have you with us, sir. Immediately over here, tall wow. fellow. And as much as he eats, it's amazing. But he is. He's, he's eats more and grows less. That's Larry Burnett. Hate people like that, Larry. I'm not spotted it myself. Yeah, that'll take you back a little bit there. The hat. Yeah. You know, you know what, was, what was interesting about that? I still have a bunch of hats. I don't wear them much anymore. Uh, what was interesting about that was that was the time when a lot of uh, duets were going 
you know, uh, Stevie Nicks and Tom Petty or Kenny Loggins and, um, you know, and Dolly Parton. And uh, anyway, a lot of duets. We had that song staying with it that we, that we finished. And Atlantic Records said, you know, this song maybe needs something. We love the song. What could we do? And our, and our manager at the time, Ken Kinnear, said, hey, let's add a girl. So without telling the band, they added this gal, Lisa Nimzo, to our new single. And when we went and did American Bandstand, we literally met her 30 minutes earlier. And it was a bit strange, but you know, sometimes record labels and managers decide stuff for you that the band doesn't really know that much about. But that was really fun. Also on our second time when we played at American Bandstand, we, we, we did that twice. Um, one time Dick said, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Firefly. And went to commercial and we went, Dick, that's not our name. And he wouldn't fix it. He came back from commercial and said, of course I meant Firefly, sorry, you know. But uh, yeah, that was fun seeing that. I used to wear a Panama, Panama hat all the time. Yeah, yeah. Mark, let's cue up the uh, solid gold here. We get a little more jock on this one. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, we're going all the way back here. Oh, baby. Archives. Incarnation of Firefall when I was briefly trying to be a blonde. Man, uh, yeah, I'll tell you what, that's funny. That was in the 80s sometime. <laughs> I've been doing it a long time there, Daniel. And very good, and very good. Uh, you also, I think you guys either just released a newer song here, right? The Nature's Way, or is that a whole album with Tim T.B. Schmidt? Well, we've, we've been releasing some singles off of that. Okay. We're holding back on the, the album. It was supposed to come out a couple of months ago, but with the pandemic and stuff, we thought this is not a really good time to, 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 to release an album. But Nature's Way was a song that Spirit did back in 1970 with Mark Andes and Randy California. And Spirit was an amazing band from Southern California. So we did a, re a version of that. And yeah, we have... Uh, Nature's Way, and we put two more songs out that you can listen to on Spotify and uh, and uh, where else? Uh, I can't remember. iTunes, uh, iTunes, and Amazon, and all those kind of things. But two other songs that uh, that we're releasing. So yeah, Firefall's putting a new album out. It should be out in September or so, and uh, we have a few new singles out and. We have a lot of fans around the, the world, and it's, uh, it's really cool to have some new material, finally. You guys are still, how many concerts before this all happened? How many concerts a year were you guys still doing? We were doing, you know, and we, you know, we weren't that busy. We were doing 50 or 60 concerts a year, kind of weekend warriors. And uh, we, had, uh, we had about 25 shows booked in the spring and the summer, which now have canceled or postponed. And so... You know, we're sitting at home now twiddling our thumbs going, now what are we going to do? But, uh, you know, I'm sure that it's going to be back. And same deal with, you know, big crowds for, for sporting events, you know. Big concerts are kind of a thing of the past now. And they're trying to figure out how to do the social distancing thing and still have live music. And we're just hanging ready to go. There's a lot of people like you, Jock, that so what are you doing with your time at home? You're a guy used to getting out and flying and getting on the bird and getting in front of people. And right. what are you doing to occupy your time right now? I've been doing a lot more artwork. 
Um, writing songs and playing music some. Um, I'm into gardening, so my backyard is about full of as many flowers as I can put in. You know, my own little personal beautification of the world in my little backyard. And, uh, you know, and I, I got a girlfriend and, and we go take walks around the lake and do stuff. So, you know, just keeping busy, but it is, it's a cabin fever for most of us out here. You talked a little bit about your own beautification of the world and you talk about nature's way. You talk about the suicide prevention. I know you've written a number of songs about for social awareness and a variety of uh, topics. Right. Just kind of talk about your love for that and, and the ventures that you've taken in that, in that realm. Well, the thing for me that was interesting was that I was in a band that had eight or 10 or 12 hit songs written by other people. Rick and Larry wrote the songs. So that it wasn't like I tried to write the perfect love song. And, you know, a lot of people write, you know, boy meets girl, boy loses girl kind of songs. And being that right brain kind of guy that I am, some of my songs would come out you know, I wrote a song called No Means No about, uh, about uh, domestic violence. And I wrote a song called When the River Rises about the flood and people losing everything. And that was another song that surprisingly was a positive message song about gaining strength in adversity and knowing that it's going to, you know, you'll get out the other end one of these days. Um, so I had the liberty being in the band, a band that already had all those love songs that people loved, like You Are the Woman and Just Remember I Love You, to kind of experiment. And a, a number of the songs that I wrote, like the suicide prevention song or the, uh, the, the flood song, When the River Rises, I'd basically give away. I'd say, hey, anybody who wants to use us or you know, play it on the radio, you know, it's, it's yours to do. So it wasn't a money-making type of thing with me and it, it was more like just you know letting whatever needed to come out come out and some of those songs were socially either uh responsible or socially a no-no to talk about because you know there's a lot of things in society that you know aren't cool to talk about and i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not shy about occasionally putting those out too yeah terrific what's out there next for you jock you got uh you know, modern medicine here, I'm going to be doing a podcast with you when you reach the next big one, which is triple digits. So I just want to know what's going to happen. <laughs> what's going to happen in the next 30 years with Jock Bartley? Wow, I, I don't know. Well, the next time we talk together, I, I, I'll get better lighting on me. You're, you're so lit up out in California, and I've got, you know, you look I've got... Good. You look good. You're kind of, you know, mysterious a little bit. There's another oh, yeah. That's right. Mysterious. Mysterious. Oh, man, mysterious. Um, you know, I, I've decided at long last to try to get my art career going and have it not just be a hobby, you know. The, the amazing thing about the art world is it's kind of more of a piranha tank than the music business is, you know. And people don't know this, but when an artist, unless you're totally famous, when an artist goes to an art gallery and shows their paintings or whatever for uh, a weekend or whatever. The art gallery usually takes 70% of the money, you know, and, you know, and their, their rationale is, of course, is, well, we're taking proven sellers off the wall to put your stuff up here, you know, but, um, you know, I really love doing art and, you know, it's a process that uh, is slower than music, but, I just feel blessed that I have a lot of different ways that I can create and, and do stuff with. I'm also, you know, uh, a bachelor and I'm a slob in my house and I need a housekeeper and stuff, but I'm kind of used to that at this point in my life. And tomorrow's my birthday. Yeah. yeah well, it's, it's hey, the big before, one, Dan. Before we get you off here, you got you got your uh, instrument there. I want I want you to just crank on something. I just want you to bring it from the soul, whatever hits you. We got to uh -oh, hear. It. Bring it from the soul. The pressure's on. <laughs> that. 
but uh, ah. it, it's fun to just sit around and noodle around and, and do that. And I figured I'd play a little guitar for you guys. But you know what? You're great, Dan. I, I, I value your friendship. And, you know, I hope you guys get playing football. And congratulations on, on the winning stuff last – was it last season, you guys? Last, last season, yeah. Oh, man, I was watching, and it's like – you're, you're the best. I wanted to tell you, too, that I remember um, th that uh, Dave Platty of CU uh, asked me if I wanted to go and watch a Dan Hawkins practice. You know, and I went, sure, man. You know, because, of course, what, what all of us as fans see is just the game and you walking around the sidelines and on that, you know. But to have watched the practice, and I, it was so disciplined. And those kids, I mean, you, you would say, okay, run, and you'd call a play. And you'd run the play, and then you'd make them run back and run the play again. Run back and run the play again. And you must have run the same play like four times or five times until they got it right. And then you call a new play. And it was just so amazing to see the discipline of the entire team. And occasionally you'd say, okay, and you'd have the, 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 uh, the second string quarterback go in. Or you'd, or you'd change the personnel. You wanted to make sure that every cog in your machine – knew what was going on. And I was so impressed because, you know, music is not disciplined at all. It is, but it's not, you know, and, you know, I'm really lucky to do what I do, but I sure value, uh, you know, what you do and it's just so great. And I'll be watching you guys this year. Oh man, you're, you're, you're a gem. You're a gem. Uh, have oh, thank a, you. much love, much respect for you. Uh, like I said, I obviously knew your music going up, growing up, and that that was cool. But what really endeared me to you was just the kind of person you are. And uh, I'm always so impressed when I see somebody. It doesn't surprise me you're so successful. Is how humble and how giving you are. And I just think that's just really rare. And I hope the people that watch this and listen to this uh, really come away with that feeling uh, because. I think about that all the time as, as revered and famous and talented as you are, just how such a humble person you are and what a blessing you are for, for everybody over there in Colorado and everybody in music for sure. Um, and I'm glad you're still rocking, but uh, really appreciate you coming on, Jock. It's been terrific. Man, thanks for having me. It's been an honor. I know you've had a lot of variety of your guests, like a guy who did Everest and, you know, and, you know, it's just like, to be included in this, I, I thank you a lot, and I wish you well, and your family and your lovely wife well, you know, have at it. Yeah, yeah, blessings to you. Hey, now, the next time you get out of the road, though, you know the guy that's the meanest with the sand shaker right here. That's me. You got it. Yeah, sand shaker. Any, anytime you come to a, a show of ours, you're welcome to get up on stage and play with us. Yes. All right, man, I appreciate thank it very you. much. Yeah, thanks for being on. Love you. Peace. Love you. Peace.